Hey guys, if you want to create anything more than just really basic visual effects for your game, then you're going to need to learn how to work with shaders. It's a really intimidating topic, but my hope is that by the end of this video, it's going to click for you and you're going to feel comfortable enough to go in and start experimenting and creating your own shaders. So this video is for you if you are brand new to shaders or if you're still a beginner working with shaders. Ready? Let's go. So I'm gonna be showing you 2D shaders since we're working with sprites and with 2D shaders for 95% of what we'll be doing in Shader Graph, there are only three things your shader is going to be doing. It'll tell Unity whether or not the texture is affected by light. It's gonna determine what parts of the texture are opaque or transparent. And it's going to determine what color the texture or certain parts of the texture are. That's really it for 95% of what you're gonna be doing with shaders. Now, you can go really deep with shaders. There's definitely a lot more that you can do. But to get started, the majority of what you need to know is actually very simple. You just need to be creative with a few basic principles and know a small handful of really useful nodes. So let's get into it by first creating a new game object and I'll add a sprite renderer to it and give it a circle sprite here. If we are using the universal render pipeline, which we are here, the default material is sprite lit default always. So let's just recreate that and then we'll do some more fun stuff soon enough. Create a new shader graph under the URP section and we'll select sprite lit graph. And let's open it. This area over here is for your properties, which will act similar to variables in your code. What you put here, if you mark them as exposed, will show up in the inspector. We've got some graph settings here and our node inputs over here. For most of what you will be doing, base color and alpha is all you're gonna need to get by. I'm not even gonna talk about the rest because they're a bit more advanced and honestly, I still don't know what they all do. So we're trying to recreate the sprite lit default shader, we said, which means all we wanna do is have this shader read the sprite from the sprite renderer and show that on our screen. Very, very basic stuff. So to do that, we need a texture for the sprite renderer to read. So let's create a new texture 2D here, and I'm gonna choose my circle texture. Okay, let's drag that in. Now to see it, we need to sample it. And here is one of my biggest gripes with Shader Graph. Sampling textures sometimes looks wrong. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my character instead to show you what I'm talking about. But when you're looking at it, there's actually nothing wrong here. What we're seeing is the actual real RGB values of our texture without alpha. So just know that when you're sampling your texture, it's often gonna look a little bit strange, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong. All right, anyways, to get this showing, drag the RGBA into the base color and the alpha into the alpha here and save. So let's create a new material from that shader and apply it to our sprite. Now you'll notice up here, there's an error saying that we don't have an underscore main text property. And this also isn't going to do what we want because if I change the sprite on my sprite renderer, it's not actually updating the texture properly. To get this texture to read from the sprite renderer automatically, we have to go back into our shader and rename this texture to main text. And it's worth noting, it's not actually the name that matters, it's the reference here. Whatever you name a property, it's gonna be called the same thing with an underscore in the reference. So underscore main text is what we want in the reference. So save that. Now, when we change our sprite, the texture down here changes as well. Okay, now let's talk about light really quickly. When we created this, we created a new sprite lit shader graph. What exactly does that mean? Well, I have a 2D light in my scene here, and if I dim that, my sprite will slowly start to turn black, meaning this sprite is affected by 2D lights. We could turn it into an unlit shader like this. Now, once I've done that, no matter what I do with the lights, the sprite is just always gonna show, meaning it's not affected by the lights. So whichever one you want depends on your use case, but if you are making a shader for fire or sparks or you know most kinds of magic effects, you're probably not going to want them to be affected by light. Now let's take a look at controlling which parts of the sprite are transparent and which parts are not. I'm gonna close this because I hate that it doesn't look like a circle, but if we preview it, this is what Shader Graph is actually going to display, okay? All right, so alpha is just a value between zero and one. All colors are actually. You've got red, green, blue, and alpha. Each of those is a value between zero and one. And alpha is very easy because black is zero and white is one. So once you get a feel for what adding and subtracting or multiplying and dividing these color values actually does, you can start getting creative pretty fast. It's just hard to wrap your head around at first. 
So to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I'm gonna bring in a gradient noise node. Noise is very common in shaders. These are your three main noise functions and you will probably use all of them a lot. But for now, I'm just gonna stick with the gradient noise. Now, if I multiply this alpha by this noise, suddenly our circle gets filled in with this noise. Why does that happen when we multiply them? Remember that black is zero, so zero times anything is zero. So this stays the same, and then all these blacks and grays are getting added in because they are multiplied by white, which is one. Anything times one equals the original thing you multiplied it by, right? It's just simple math, but it is hard to wrap your head around it because they're colors, so it's hard to visualize it until you get used to it. So if we had added them instead of multiplying, the middle was already all white. So it'll just go into a more intense white in certain sections of the circle, which will make more sense before the end of this video. Meaning by the end of this video, you'll understand what happens when you have a color value that is greater than one. Now we've got some options here, so let's just have a little bit of fun. We could plug this into the color and have our circle have this nice noise pattern on it. Or we could plug it into the alpha. Again, we have to remember that alpha is just a color between zero and one. Zero is black, white is one. So now all the black parts will be the most transparent. When you plug something into the alpha, black equals fully transparent. White parts being fully opaque. Okay, so to showcase this a little bit better, I'm gonna bring in my character actually and get rid of this circle. Now, bear in mind, if you have a character with multiple body parts with their own sprite renderer, each of those sprite renderers are going to need their own material on it. But see, now because of that noise that we plugged into the alpha, he's partially transparent in certain areas. Okay, so let's take a second to talk about UVs. You'll notice our noise has a UV input here. Scale does what it sounds like, but what is a UV? A UV is basically like a vector to position on a texture. You can think of the bottom left to be zero on the X, zero on the Y, and the top right to be one on the X and one on the Y. So how does this help us? Let's add a tiling and offset node in here, which is arguably one of the nodes you'll use the most in your shaders ever. The tiling and offset node is a UV node, meaning it contains our entire texture, but it has a few more options that we can play with. So what happens if we stretch the UV of our texture? And if we plug this in over here, it will literally stretch this noise. And if we offset it, we can just keep on scrolling. Noise is procedural, so you can do this infinitely to get a random noise pattern. So here is where you can start getting really, really creative with stuff. And let's say, what if we wanted to animate this? If we add in a time node, and we want to be able to control our scroll speed, this is an X and Y over here, so let's create a vector2 up here called scroll speed, and default the X to 0 0.1 and we're gonna multiply time by this vector two and plug that into the offset. Now suddenly you have this nice infinite scrolling noise. And you can do the same with any of our noise nodes. And actually you can plug this into the angle offset in the Voronoi node as well to get some really interesting effects going on. All right, let's have a little bit more fun with this. Let's say we don't want any gray. We just want it to be either fully transparent or fully opaque. The step node is really great for that because it will display anything in full white only if the value is below this threshold. So if we plug this in over here instead, you have the beginnings of a really cool dissolve effect starting to happen. Now, if we were gonna make a proper dissolve effect, what would really make this look better is if we had a nice glowing outline around the dissolving parts. So knowing the very basics of what we've already covered in this video, we can already do this because we just need to get a little bit creative with some very basic math. We can take a look at this and say, okay, if we take this, but expand it to be just a little bit bigger and then subtract those two values from each other, maybe that will give us a really nice looking line. Let's go ahead and try it. I'm gonna turn this into a float called dissolve threshold. Then I'm gonna do this again. but also add another float called line thickness. So we've got dissolve threshold plus our line thickness. It's going into a step node from the same noise and then subtract this one from the other one. 
And there you go, that worked. And since this expands out further than the original, we want to plug in the second step into our multiply here since that gets plugged into our alpha. Because this line is white, we actually want it included in our alpha, right? Because anything white in the alpha is what actually shows up on our texture. That's what makes it opaque. I hope that makes sense. We want the line to show, so we want it showing in the alpha as well. So we have to add it in. So that's the alpha, but to actually get it to show as a color, let's add it with the original texture color. We're just adding this on top of the original. There you go, right? It seems really complicated, but if you look at this shader, a good chunk of all the nodes we're using are just basic math, adding and multiplying, etc. All right, next, how can we make it so that we can change the color of this line? We wanna be able to control the color of it. We use multiply. You wanna change the color of something? Use a multiply node. Then once that's done, we need to swap out the connections so that we're using the colored version instead of the white one. Okay, so this is a good time to talk about emission because I'm seeing that happening on our character right now. And actually, I wanna get away from this example because this is not a dissolve shader tutorial. I have a much more in-depth tutorial on that topic which you can watch right here. What we're doing right now is just learning the very basics of shader graph. I don't wanna to get too complicated with this. So we're gonna work with a new example. Let's say you have some particles and you wanna make them glow in your scene. How can you do that? Let's create another shader. And we're gonna start exactly the same. We need a main text, and we need to sample it. Now there are two ways to use emission when we're working with 2D shaders. Number one is you can multiply this by an HDR color, which is a method you will see very, very, very commonly. HDR means high dynamic range, which means this color can have an intensity value applied to it between minus 10 and 10. So if we multiply the texture by this HDR color and plug that into our base color and use the alpha for the alpha, you'll see that yes, in combination with our global volume, these particles are glowing once we swap out their material for the one we just made. And there's nothing wrong with this approach. But in this particular scenario, this is for a particle system, I want the color to derive from here or from here, not from our shader itself. So again, everything is just math. It doesn't have to be a color. You don't have to use HDR color. The value just has to be greater than the threshold on our bloom. So we can literally just create a float and multiply this color by that emission multiplier. And there you go. This one also doesn't have an arbitrary limit of 10. And we can use the color up here or the color over lifetime and still get that nice emission on top of it. Really quick, I wanna bump this back and show you the different blend modes that you've got. Everything we have been doing is on the alpha blend mode, meaning each sprite's alpha is controlled by only the material from this shader, but we have other options at our disposal. Let's change this to additive real quick. Notice I've set the emission to one, so we wouldn't really expect a glow, but if we duplicate this particle system, they start glowing when particles go over top of other particles, literally meaning the alphas add together. The alphas add what is in the background. So this can be a great blend option for fire or magic and different effects like that. I'm gonna go ahead and be honest and just say I have no idea what pre-multiply or multiply or for or why I'd use them. If you know, then leave a comment down below because I'm really curious to know, particularly if you have a specific use case for when they would be good to use. Okay, and since we're covering the basics and one of the most important things you're gonna to wanna to know is how to actually affect this shader with code. Remember how I said the name isn't important. It's the reference when we renamed our texture to main text, remember? That's true when you're coding as well. So let's copy this reference here and create a new script called change emission. What I like to do is use the shader.property2id function, which just lets us save that string we just grabbed as an integer that we can now reference. 
So first, to change a shader, we change it on the material level, not the shader level. So let's get a reference to our particle system renderer. And get the material from there. Next, I'm just going to set our emission value based on an arbitrary incrementer value that'll get brighter and brighter over time because this is just a really simple example. So to actually change this emission multiplier property we created, we get the reference to our material and say dot set float. If it was a color, we'd say dot set color, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's lots of different functions, but we set up a float, so we're changing a float. And we'll use this int we created up here and set it to our incrementer value. And let's place that script on our particle system. And there you go. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. Like the video if you liked, and thanks so much for watching. Bye. I'd like to give a very special thank you to all of our Hall of Fame patrons, Jakob Yonduck, Christopher Nichols, Zondra Kessler, Fontaine Waite, Brainwaves to Binary, Couch, KB at Bird Tech Games, and Ian Oral, as well as our Early Access patrons, Ken Waite, Mason Crow, Liquid Egg, Alexander Prestis, Jude Greaves, Felipe Gomez dos Santos, Ober, Francesco Latamata, Bill Guo, Alon on Mars, Alex Friedman, Daniel Rathliff, Neil, Ben Kerberger, Minton Tran, Maurizio Tolfa, Stephanie, Jamie, Kev, Connor Burnham, Kyrandranos, and Ro E. If you choose to support us on Patreon, you can get early access to all of our YouTube videos, monthly alpha builds, and more.